afternoon. Uh, our next speaker, our next speaker has passionately taught literature for three decades now at Xavier Ateneo. She has also earned, uh, where she finished her Bachelor of Arts degree in English language cum laude. She has also earned her MA in English and PhD in education with her dissertation on the critical literacy and social engagement of college students. Recently, she has rekindled her interest in writing poetry after a long break. Her poems are published in the 2021 Kinaadman, a journal of Southern Philippines, volume 43. During her free time, she uploads her transcreation and analysis of vernacular poems in her YouTube channel. Let us welcome Kath Kainya Adahar, PhD. Thank you, Adeva. Good afternoon, Satanan. May hapon. Okay, so Adeva uh, gave you more warm up ganina. Warm up na punta. But this time, tindog. Ha? Tindog. Okay, para alive kayo ta. Ha? And with your permission, I'm going to make a modification of the tagbo club. Okay. Atong tagbo club ma modification mo ni ha. Uh, William Wordsworth. This one. 
Oh yeah, Robert Frost. Kailan lagi mo nila ang call, no? Oh, so we were more familiar with them, no? Sadly, wala kayo mga binisaya, mga kuan na mga literary pieces, no? So we were more familiar with them. Now, as far as I can remember, only one subject when I was still in college, particularly English 5, Poetry, where our professor, Dr. Mark Labunto, told us to look for an English poem and pair it with a Visayan poem. So dito, nagalungkat na po kong bali kong Visaya, uh, Visaya ng magazine. And he asked us to compare and contrast the poems. And as far as I can remember, that's the only activity. No? Kay most of the time, foreign poetry. Okay? There's nothing wrong with that. No? However, we should also be exposed to local poetry. But I feel that there was no available material. No? Nagyamuyamo, si Nancy. No? Na siya, no? That's why it's the challenge that is posed by uh, Mr. Ricardo de Andrea. So he was here yesterday and this morning. And also uh, cultural and literary historian Resil B. Mohades. No? So that um, Ricardo de Andrea couldn't overemphasize the need to study literature from the regions to contribute to national identity. He has long opposed the Manila centric view on studying only Manila or Luzon-based literature as a representation of what is considered Philippine literature. So, um, Resil Mojares, who is National Artist huh, for Literature in 2018, had long suggested the strengthening of the teaching of Philippine literature in the native languages in the curriculum. So, I was then a teacher, no? In 1993. And then only in 1996 that Ched gave this mandate. No? Literature one must cover literatures of the Philippines and should focus on all the regions of the Philippines, whether written in native or foreign languages, from the beginning of Philippine history to the present. And this challenge was somehow answered by Benvenido Lumbera. No? So he produced this book, he edited this book in 2001. I have a copy. <laughs> yeah, and if you can see, no, this was um, brought in Capitol University, CU. He was there, I was fortunate to attend that lecture. And in fact, I have his signature. Oh, wow. okay. He signed the book, so kamo, mamalit mo ubuan, Coming home, the kalandrakas, o papil magin mo sa author. Okay, we will never know. They will become the future national artist, ba? Oh, grabe na kung promote ha. <laughs> okay, no so inana ang situation sa una. Alright, then okay. So this one was tackled by April this morning, no? For the senior high school, so under the K to twelve program, the twenty first century literature. And take a look, 40 hours long, no? And world literature and regional literature. So, so ako naman na. Hila ba, 20 hours ang isa, 20 hours ang isa, no? And the Filipino and, uh, uh, Filipino and English literature, no? In college, they were taken out. I'm happy that we have as an answer, next slide, we have the following, no? So they were already launched, and one of the sources could also be Mindanao Harvest 4. So you have one, two, three, and that's the fourth one. And yesterday, we saw Mark Christine Godinez, one of the editors, so you can also use that, okay? So for this afternoon, I'm going to share to you analysis of four poems, two from Telesporo Songkit Jr. So, gone too soon with Kaisha, no? Um, he died last year. And we are going to tackle Pamalandong and Taliwala sa Entropy. And the points of Gracian Paul Tidor is actually now a lawyer, no? His poems, Kabalaka and Huna Huna. Mutunga kun wadamha. Salayu sa imong katawa. 
sa imong pagkatulog manuok tuwa tuwa sa kahinan usa damgo adiser kamu mamu kanunay ng pahinungdum sa umaabot o nagpaabot electric fan nga nalintan ng palong bayronon nga nagkadaghan utang nga angay bayran pagpangasaba sa asawa anak nga wak pamipauli pigula nga nagtinga sulod sa imo I actually looked into all the contents and then I realized that there are four poems whose themes or conflict are quite related. So I've chosen them. And I'm going to also share to you how poetic elements such as figurative language, connotation, imagery, word choice, and tone contribute to the theme. So after that, I have realized no, that the four poems reveal a commonality among the personas which is being contemplative with hints of angst, fear, and anger, but with certain degrees of optimism. And to get one word to summarize that, it's actually vexation. We seldom hear, hear that. So they mean vexation. No? So I've looked into its synonyms. Annoyance, disappointment, irritation, disgust, indignation, no? anger, annoyance, pagkagalit, pagkainis, or bisamukan, kalingasa ba? No? So mga complaints bitaw na to, no? So mga siya ang vexation, okay? So I attempt to answer the following questions. How do the poetic elements help bring out the theme of vexation? And what commonalities exist among the personas of the poems? Okay, so all the four poems express man's anxiety, restlessness, and uncertainty through the use of literary devices such as figurative language, connotation, imagery, and tone. Now, to give us the concrete definition of anxiety, so from the American Psychological Association, they label anxiety as an emotion characterized by feelings of tension, worried thoughts, and physical changes. So you can see that in the images. Okay? At least the first two indicators are exhibited in the poems. However, the feeling of uncertainty is more prominent in one poem only as the rest show signs of confidence but mixed with some resignation when the poems reach the conclusion part. So, for feelings of tension and worried thoughts from Kabalaka, mutunga kulwa damha sa sa imong katawa. It's an example of an irony. Like, outside, the person may be laughing, but deep inside, no? he is um, worried, he is what, sad. No? And another two lines there, Example of personification, okay? Sa imong pagkatulog, manuok, tunga-tunga sa kahinanok. Diba? So, it's like a person choking you. No? Our thoughts are like persons. Okay? So, that's personification. And then, in huna-huna, ang huna-huna, usa ka dakbayan. So, it was uh, said by April earlier. Di inanubo ang habog na building sa kabalaka, kalibog kagulanan. So when you translate that into English, kabalaka, your worries, kalibo, confusion, kagulanan, sorrow. So next slide. Yeah. So our thoughts, no? similar to a city, pero sa klase ng siyudad, gubot, no? na ay daghang, nanubo, nga mga building. So it's like our thoughts no? are filled with what? Kanama. Confusion, nanubo, kuno na sila. Sama sa tag-as nga building. No? And that's an example of visual imagery. And in pamalandong, okay, so when we say pamalandong, it's reflection. Di ba? So, uh, Lenten season na ta. So, time to reflect. Right? So, it's also another working in the mind where the persona contemplates 
on man's destination in life. Matagkaroon og unya atong mahuna-huna nga duhalay painan sa atong dalan. So perhaps he's, he's thinking about death. Asa man na After we live here, where is our destiny? And then, the next few lines, Hades o paraiso, langit o impyerno, nirvana, kamaloka, ikapito, or una. So as shown in the opening line, no, so the destination of a person can just be two, Hades or paraiso. So it can, it's an example of what figure of speech? Now uh, we're in your borrow a statement from previous literature. Sure. Mga teachers, sige maka-answer, no? Well, ako na mga students, so kana siya, allusion. No? So we allude. Okay? Okay, there. So Hades, where does it come from? Greek mythology, right? Paraiso. Okay, from the Bible. If you remember, di ba? Uh, when Jesus Christ was crucified, there were two thieves. And then, he told one thief na, uh, you shall be with me in paradise. Okay? So the first person to go to heaven is that thief. Okay. What about nirvana? So in Hinduism and Buddhism, it's the highest state that someone can attain. A state of enlightenment. Meaning a person's individual desires and suffering go away. On the other hand, kamaloka is a Sanskrit word and defined as an astral world or psychic realm where there is no conscious existence for the dead until they are reincarnated into the physical world. So, allusion is silang tanan, okay? And then, interestingly, T.S. Sungkit also hints at these seven heavens in his other poem, Taliwala sa Entropy, from the line, Pito ang among langit. So, both poems mention seven heavens. So, I wonder, kung sa magiging seven heavens, no? So, Last in the enumeration of the soul's destination points to a seventh or the first realm. Interestingly, there are cultures which believe in seven heavens. The belief can be traced back to a mythology in ancient Babylonia, and the number seven may have been sourced from the celestial bodies nearest to Earth, namely Mercury, Venus, the Sun, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Then, Hinduism, Judaism, including Islam, also have this belief where in the latter, according to the Quran, Muhammad journeyed through the seven heavens. So, mude ni siya ang source, no? But I wonder kung sa kinainig seven heavens, okay? And then, ti asungkit, ehikaunun, okay? Whose culture, we can go to the next slide, is related to the manobos, no? So, ehikaunun siya, then related ko na sa mga manobos alludes the belief of, of the indigenous peoples of Bukidnon about heaven having seven layers. This is even portrayed by artist Nono Estarte in his painting that is exhibited in Museo de Oro. So, if you have time no, to go back to Xavier, we have Museo de Oro there. This painting is found there. So, while well, I was um, analyzing, and then I recall that time no, when um, Nona started, gave us a tour in the museum. And I made a phone call to uh, Mr. Estarte. So during my interview with him, he revealed that his basis in making this masterpiece was Carmen Onapia's book, which he faintly remembers having the title Folk Literature in Mindanao. After further investigation, I've come across the article of Father Francisco Dimetrio, S.J. The Bukidnon Myths of Sickness, Death, and Afterlife, where the eminent scholar and priest who founded Museo de Oro and also commissioned Estarte to create the painting, cites Luis Pasal from the collection of Onabia that goes so, that the heaven is supported on two trees. It has seven layers. The first is the heaven of happiness and joy, the home of the Diwata. The second heaven is that of beautiful designs, which beautiful girls copy on the clothes of their brothers. The third is the soft heaven, home of the witch and troublemakers. Na the heaven the witch, no? The fourth is the technicolored heaven, abode of Limandev, the war spirit, Talabusaw, 
The fifth is the horizontal heaven, home of Lintugot, director of thunder and lightning. The sixth heaven is the domed or secular heaven where Tinambulong, patron of Olaging singers, lives. And the highest heaven on the seventh level is the abode of the Almighty, Magbabaya, who wills everything. So that comes from the account of Father Demetrio. Okay? And um, Demetrio adds that the seven levels also compare to the account of Victorino Sawai. This name was mentioned by uh, Mr. De Umbria yesterday, no? who also got it from his father, Dato um, Kinolintang. Although Sawai only mentions the last three upper levels. So for me, Songkit must have been influenced by this belief. So he included it in his two poems. Paradox, because when you journey, but then you go back to yourself. Well, journey entails going to other places, but going back to the self. No? So as the point of Malandong reaches the end of the second stanza, the persona boldly claims, Ako ray padulungan ko. Despite his uncertainty, and this can be a form of paradox, since the journey does not entail any long distance travel because his being is his end point. So this can also suggest the persona's existentialist view of life where he is the sole determinant of his fate. And then, in Taliwala sa Entropy, I translated that into English in the midst of disorder. So unlike the other poems where the tension is explicitly expressed, the persona here wants the readers to journey with him to discover the conflict he is in. And this is precisely his vexation when he claims that lies will become the truth in Manitood ang Bakak. And when the unfit will rule in Muhari ang Tabaghak. These are both forms of irony for they convey opposites in meaning. Rulers are expected to display desirable qualities and good should triumph over evil. But the opposite happens, no? Maninood ang bakak. Diba? The lies will become truth. Muhari ang tabagha. Who will rule? Kato mga di maayo. Mga dautan, sila ang maghari. No? So these are examples of irony. Okay. So in the phrase, maninood ang bakak, no? So the word bakak means a lie. And then if you see that, no? of course it's an irony. And uh, in my research, I have come across one study uh, telling us that there is an emerging Cebuano figurative language. It's called animation. No? So, meaning animation. So this was coined by Alejandrino when she analyzed for, uh, poems of Cindy Velasquez. Example, Ang mga tinta manglupad. Okay? Mulupad ba ang tinta? Dili man. Nga naman nga manglupad ang tinta mo. So what siguro ka naglagsik? No? Okay. So in one of the questions that I also raised earlier, um, I want to find out what's the tension of the personas. No? What are they feeling? Now, when I was still a new teacher, we had this seminar, the same venue here, we invited Leon Chuteriada. And then he said, na, poetry has tension, okay? Na conflict. But it's not like the conflict that we have in a short story, na, man versus man, diba? Klaro kaayo. But here, the conflict can be obstructed, okay? So, the four poems, no, reveal mass vex uh, vexation, but they vary at certain degrees. So, it was read earlier, no, in, in Kabalaka, Pagaguol, Diba? Muna ang tension sa, sa persona. Okay? And this is sustained until the end, no? When the persona enumerates, no? What is it that bothers him? Ita katulog ko gabi i. Mukha kong tagmata. Sama na ako gabi i. Siya kong matamata. <laughs> Nakuhal ko. Na-anxious ko sa akong lecture na bas masayop ko or what. Diba? Experience kaya po na ninyo? No? Kanaboy ka na ko na ko na ko na. Siya kong buhaton ugma. No? Ita katulog ko taro. No? And then the tension in Kabalaka, I think, nagi diha sa last two lines po, no? Tigula nga nagtinga, sulod sa imong huna-huna. It's just in the mind. So perhaps here, the person is afraid to die? No? That's really the beauty of poetry because it is up to us to discover what is it really that is the conflict of the persona. No? 
And sometimes we, di ba, we fear death. What's going to happen to us afterwards? And it all happens in the mind. Okay? And then by using the word, no? Nagtinga. The poet not only creates an image of a person at the brink of death, but also allows the readers to hear an old man's gasping for breath. So, dili lang siya visual imagery, but also sound. Okay, pumatang makadungog, nagtinga siya. Okay? Thus, making the couplet an appeal to sight and sound imagery. By ending the poem in this manner, it hints at the ultimate reason for the restlessness, which is the fear of dying. But again, it just takes place in the mind. And then in Huna Huna, no? like a balaka, the, uh, this poem present, presents man's pensive mood. Okay? It shows the persona's affirmation that the mind is capable of accommodating so many thoughts that it is likened to a city with skyscrapers representing fears, perplexities, and woes. He further makes use of metaphor and personification contained in one line, Pagkaalingasa ning dakbayan. The metropolis, which is compared to the mind, is given a human attribute that can be annoying or disturbing. Then he qualifies this chaos by comparing the inhabitants, bagang panon sa katauhan, to restless souls. Nag-alindasay ang nagkundinar ng mga kalag. But of course, these are not dead people. Di ba? And adds that they are all alike. Nga daw walay kalahian. Hinting that everyone in the crowded city is ill at ease. Nga naay mga pagubot, no? Busy ka ayo. As what Shakespeare said, di ba? Ito yung gingon sa Act 5, Scene 5 sa Macbeth full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Okay. Furthermore, in Huna Huna, no? the persona compares the mind to a big forest. So we saw that earlier in the video of April. No? Where one gets lost, makasaag ang gitakon ni lasang. However, there's a hint of moving away from the crowded city to go to the woods to search for a lone tree with lush leaves. This verdant tree can symbolize peace of mind that the personas long for. Hagbay kurang ipangita. Trees also offer an image of life which contrasts to the lifeless skyscrapers found in urban places. No, na contrast kay ganihan, habo uh, habo ng mga building pero kani ipangita niya ang kahoy, no? So, nature versus lifeless buildings. So, this last stanza therefore suggests that Despite the chaos that goes on in the mind, the persona locates a place to remain relaxed or calm since it has been there all along, as suggested in the line, Namugat pag-ayo sa yuta. Despite how disturbed a person can be, he can still find that inner peace offered by the mind. However, there is a suggestion that the persona doesn't have any intention of staying there as he only wants to take advantage of its shade temporarily based on the line. Buot raon ko magpalandong ning kahuya so that he can listen to the wind aron maminaw sa hangin to the song of the passing bird o sa awit sa namalabay langgam to the rustle of the leaves sa kanaas sa mga dahon and the weariness of silence sa laylay sa kahilo. However, the last line offers some ambiguity. The line can be a form of personification and irony at the same time. Silence is given the human attribute of being tired or exhausted kay laylay sa kahilo. Okay? Is this figurative language actually pointing to the persona who is weary? The line can also be a form of irony since his reason for staying under the shade of the tree is to listen. Arun maminaw, no? Listen to nature and be away from the hustle and bustle of life. But he ends up listening to his vexation. So one can be reminded of um, Robert Frost stopping by woods in a snowy evening when the speaker is tempted to stop and watch the woods fill up with snow, but has to continue with his journey because of the promises he kept. In Hunahuna, lay lay sa kahilom, 
appears to be disturbing to the persona that instead of communing with nature, he is reminded of his troubles in life. No? So, pwede din siya two meanings na nag-relax na siya dito, pero sige mo siya guna-una, kasi ang problema. No? That's why he will not stay there forever. He continues with his journey, just like the persona in Stopping by Woods. Okay? And then the tension in Pamalandong. If vexation in the two earlier poems is derived in a serious tone, this is presented in a light, resigned manner by the persona in Pamalandong. This is a form of irony since contemplation entails some serious thinking. But as the speaker reflects on man's faith, he delivers it in a mocking way. So the following no, can be the justification. Kay dili man mahimo nga mo adtukos lain, do na onyay balain. Umasuko bagaha sa akong pagpataka. Nga luyos kinabuhi ang patay pirming buhi. So the lines in the attack against some beliefs claiming that the soul has a resting place in the afterlife. The persona admits that someone might be angry at him for his allegations. This existentialist view is further expressed in a resigned but disgusted manner when he compares himself to a bird and a black ant. Pastilan, may panglanggam, magsigil at pangigham, o may pang mga sulom, huwag kabalak ang nag-om. So humor is also produced by these two lines, or by these lines, as readers may be amused by the comparison of the persona to an animal and an insect with the witty rhyme, langgam and pangigham. Sulom and Tagom. So the interjection pastilan, which has no English equivalent, is an expression that connotes disgust as the speaker complains that the state of the bird and the ant is much better than his. May pag may pangkoan, no? Sulom. So aside from the use of personification, as they are given human attribute, the lines may pang mga sulom, may kabalak ang dagom, are paradoxical since ants are afraid of the rainy days, but since they prepare for it ahead, they are not as tensed when rain pours. So this can also be an allusion to what? Fable. Okay, the ant and the grasshopper. Bigyan ang jacket. <laughs> Thank you. So furthermore, the persona claims that the bird and the ant are superior to him since they have used their third eye. Na may nag-mention dito, no? Di sama na akong buta ang ikatulong mata. No? So there's a reference to the third eye. And this can be another allusion. No? What practice uh, would have this belief na naate third eye? Okay? So, kaniko no, one of the seven main chakras. Oh, Adeba, ang saan mga chakra? Oo, na? O saan ka na ang religion, Adeba? Buddhism? Okay. No, Hinduism? Okay? So, inner wisdom and is responsible for the intuition or gut feeling and once a person has acted upon decisions based on it he's exercising his third eye so the persona attributes his limited knowledge about man's end to this unutilized third eye hindi ko na ginagamit ang third eye maumduharay balang mga tumong sa dalan because we don't use now our third eye so then the poem concludes with maumahangtod ka ron why hanaw lang hapon? Where the persona admits his limitations if he sticks to the binary destination of man, right or left, heaven or hell. So to conclude, the persona might be advocating for an acceptance of whatever belief man has on afterlife. This has been hinted at earlier in the poem when he acknowledges his being a lumad, a native, and wishes to settle the issue by saying, Aron why daghang labad ako ray padulingan ko. So like you 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 respect no what I want no you respect my belief. Okay? Therefore to solve man's worries he calls for acceptance as in let me be who I am. The poem may be sending a message that the natives or indigenous people or any person must be left alone with his beliefs. And finally in taliwala sa entropy the persona is disgusted over the chaos in society and admits that no matter where a person may be, whether on top or below, he experiences chaos 
as shown in the lines, padulong sa kayagaw, upus man o ibabaw. Wherever you are, whether you're on top or down. So he may be hinting at a conflict between the superior and the oppressed, or maybe describing an entropy that might take place in the mountains or in the lowlands, sa taas, sa ubus. Most likely, it's a misunderstanding between parties that the persona's group or tribe wishes not to take part in. Kining tanang kagubot ang di pagkasinabot kung asa na musangbot, di na mi manginlabot. Therefore, they are trapped in between. So kinsa may nag-away sa taas o sa ubos. So that's for us to discover. So there is a possibility that the persona is trapped amidst insurgency problem where there's clash between the military and the rebels so considering the author's background who is a lumad from Bukidnon and there are accounts of encounters between the Philippine army and the communist party of the Philippines New People's Army or CPP NPA in the province as reported by Philippine News Agency thus the persona is in the middle taliwala of the chaos as suggested in the title. However, if one investigates further, the persona may also refer to the injustices that the Lumads have gone through, especially on land grabbing. He considers the act as a form of deception against them as evidence in the lines. Kay daan ng nasayod, nga tupas pagsugod, nga ila dry matuod, din hiniining nasod. No? He reveals that from the very start, the country has tricked them. So in the 1979 article from the Philippine Studies titled Social Change and Religion Among the Bukidnon, Vincent Collin enumerates several instances when the indigenous peoples of the province were displaced from their ancestral domain and reduced to interlopers as corporations like Bukidnon Sugar Central or Busco and the Philippine Packing Corporation were established and as Presidential Decree 705 required them to obtain forest residence, per, uh, forest residence permits to their native land. Colin further reveals that the Lumans under powerless circumstances are faced with alternatives, flight, Resignation or violence. Either lagas mo, no? flight, or surrender na lang, resignation, or violence, maging away. So more evidence that the persona is speaking as a lumad can be traced from line 17 to 18 of the poem when he considers himself like a bagani, okay? Or maybe an offspring of a bagani, which in Manobo is a warrior. Maayo na lang gani liwat ko sa bagani pito ang kinabuhi. So according to the entry about the Higaonon from the National Commission for Culture and the Arts, the bagani is the dato or chieftain's right hand man and the war general who heads a platoon of young warriors who in time of peace are the dato's bodyguards. So unlike the three earlier poems where the tension of the personas is internal and private, the speaker in Taliwala sa Entropy faces a societal battle acknowledging a collective effort with this group. Sa among pakigbato, our fight. So it's not just my fight, but our, atong, among pakigbato against the common enemy who has, uh, who has oppressed them. He vows to rise after a fall, as expressed in the lines, Mubangon ang nahapla, mutindog ang nahagba. The poem ends with a strong fighting spirit, as the speaker compares the assault towards the enemy to that of ark shell or mollusk, Uksama sa tapurok, muasdam o mohorok, which are known to attack in groups. Grupo din yung mga ark shell or mollusk when they attack they are doing it in groups. So the definition of mohoro cannot be found easily. So I asked Wawai Sawai, uh, a former uh, Wawai Sawai, and then another one, a classmate in 
um, art appreciation training si Dagok and Tonda Posala. I asked them, kung sa di ay kuan, muhurok, no? And they all provide the same meaning to the word. And it is group assertion. Although Kale narrated how the Lumad would say, we will just take poison and die, and you won't be bothered with us anymore. You see that? Ilang resignation ba nga, na lang ni, no? Although, no, he, he found it in the account, no? You won't be bothered with us anymore. When his land is seized by ranchers or logging companies, the Bukidnon native, when with a group, would say, we are ready to die. One can expect an impending violence. Therefore, Sungkit's poem concludes with notes of optimism that they can fight back against the enemy. So, in conclusion, no, kita niya mga introduce dia. So all the uh, all the four poems present uh, man's vexation that springs from an inner conflict such as random concerns caused by challenges of living or thoughts about dying and the soul's destination. An external conflict such as facing a societal battle against oppression and injustice. The four poems reveal a commonality among the personas which is being contemplative with hints of angst, fear, and anger, but with certain degrees of optimism. This theme has been presented by using powerful uh, figurative language, um, unraveled through close scrutiny of the text and an investigation on the allusions presented. So there is more to discover in these poems written by Mindanawan poets, as one can glean on their experiences of Filipinos no? outside the NCR or Luzon. Although vexation may be a universal disposition, one can gain insights on its form, tangible or otherwise, from the perspective of poets from Mindanao. So therefore, this is the challenge now for everyone. Let us patronize, embrace, discuss, include, pay attention to, love, consume local literature. So can we make a pledge? <laughs> can we stand? We? Let, let us all stand and make a pledge. Okay, so I will, no? Sige. Everybody go repeat after me. I will patronize. I will patronize. Embrace. Embrace. Discuss. Discuss. Include. Include. Consume. Consume. Pay attention to. Pay attention to. Love. Love. Local literature. Local literature. Okay, tagbo clap. Wait, choreography. Wait, choreography. Got to get enough. Pack, pack, pack. Pack, pack, pack. Again, me. Okay, tagbo clap with choreography. Go. Tagbo. Okay, thank you very much. So, last line na lang ako, no? So, uh, in my own little ways, I discuss local literature through my YouTube channel. Promote ko. Uh, anyway, if you if you'd like, no? So uh, you can you can message me. You can take a look at my YouTube channel, Art Ads, no? I have already uh, made transcreation no? of uh, different poems. I made analysis. Ang isa ani gikan sa babay bilbilon, my favorite po na adiri, no? Feminism. I discussed there kana kuan kani make the male gaze, no? So that's found in ano, uh, Gikan sa Babayang Bilbilon. And then you have Father Living. Um, you have, kani, um, Samtang na sakay taghabalabal. Balaki ko dahi. No? I made an analysis of that. And I asked some students to also dramatize some scenes. And then you have Tai Paulit na Bayay ang Saudi. And then you saw yesterday, um, Mr. Raul Moldes, di ba? That's his point. Akong gikuan niya po, ang agila ka ni Ato na himong maya ka ron. And you also have um, from Visayas, no? si Pinang Kag, si Istoy. You also have, I also have another one. I compared the poem of Anthony Tan to crash landing on you. O, di ba? Yun sa kanya compare. Tanawa akong video. Anyway, thank you very much for listening to my talk. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, no, Mang Kang, for that very interesting uh, take on these poems, no? So, pwede na i-gyo na ako compare and contrast. Ang Chloe. <laughs> Ang poem. Thank you, Mangkan. Alright, you proceed.